Hello Year 10. It's now proper Lesson 13. Now, if you've done this properly, you've already seen the supplemental video. However, if you haven't, great. Uh, there's a good point in this video to go and watch it and to come back after it's done. Um, I can't put them in the same video because the video for the supplemental stuff, uh, which is going over Triumph as Villains, is um, quite lengthy and also would get it insta banned on YouTube. So, uh, banned, not banned. Uh, so alternatively, I have to do this lesson separate. So I do apologize about the weirdly out of kilter features here. And just in case you haven't seen that other video, just to make it clear, and it will date the video, I'm doing this very deliberately, so I can't use this in a lesson when I'm off, um, Black Lives Matter. And I have to say that. Um, I've now said it in two videos. You've hopefully all seen that. Uh, it's important. It is, as I say, the literal least I can do. So, um, without further ado, uh, and with reference to Anais Nim, my French author friend, um, she's not a French author friend, she's dead, I, I don't know her. Um, I'm going to talk to you about today's lesson. So, here it is. I'm going to start with a source, because we're historians and that's what we do. Here it is, and it's a source, it's a quote from Adolf Hitler's uh, book, his uh, best-selling uh, memoirs, uh, Mein Kampf how different time would have been and how different history would have been if its title had been Mein Kampf v. Chair. He says, when an opponent declares, I will not come over to your side, I calmly say, your child belongs to us already. What are you? You will pass on. Your descendants, however, now stand in the new camp. In a short time, they will know nothing else but this new community. This quote is often called chilling by those that have come afterwards, and many historians refer to it as deeply disturbing. And I'm not sure I agree totally, but I get where they're coming from. Hitler is essentially saying, well, what? Pause the video and uh, come back when my physog appears. Ah, my physog won't appear. Uh, hang on, I will... Um... There we go. So, you've had a time to think about it. What do you think he's trying to say? Obviously, he's trying to say that uh, the youth of the future, that old people who don't want to join in, they're going to die soon. Hitler doesn't have to convert people his own age. He has to convert the youth. If he converts the youth, if he gets the young on side, then they will create a future that will know no different. And then everyone will be Nazis. So he doesn't need to convince your parents. He doesn't need to convince your grandparents. He needs to convince you. He needs to get you, the youth, on his side. And so the youth are going to be very important to the Nazis. To prove the point, I have Hans Schem. Hans Schem is the head of the National Socialist Lehrerbund, or the National uh, Socialist Teachers Union. And he has to say, those who have youth on their side control the future. Of course they do. I've said it before to you guys, and let me repeat it. You guys are important. Absolutely. So, the question is this. What can you learn about Nazi attitudes to young people? If you're playing the game, you'll pause the video and have a think about it. Maybe even write some things down. Pause. And on pause. What does this suggest about Nazi attitudes? What can we learn? We can learn that the Nazis see them as intrinsically important. You've probably got a couple of quotes to back that up. I mean, the entire source. Um, also, you've got this idea that the Nazis want to indoctrinate. We talked about indoctrination before. Uh, they want to make sure that the entirety of German society is Nazi. You remember the propaganda, perhaps. Some of you will have written this down. Some of you will have come up with the link yourself. You'll remember that Josef Goebbels essentially said he wanted 100% of Germans, 100% on side, 100% of the time. And we said that this is an impossible goal for propaganda. But if you get the youth on board, it's much easier. Now, that's not to say the youth are weak-minded or weak-willed, which some people will say, and some of you will probably have said as well, are oh, easier to convince young people. I don't think it is. You guys are more used to question. You guys are more used to kicking against authority. The idea of putting you into uniforms and forcing you to wear them, well, you know how that goes. So why were the Nazis so successful? You've got to ally that with something. In school, education is generally something that is done to you, so you kick against it. Uniforms are done to you, so you kick against it. Imagine if those uniforms carried something extra, though. Imagine if the people of Duffield didn't view you with suspicion. Imagine if those uniforms made people shrink back in fear. Oh, wait, you don't have to imagine. There is a uniform that does that. The hooded top, 
the black coats, the peaked caps. That uniform does make people shrink back in fear. There is a march you do, except it's a swagger. There is a transportation system you use, it's usually bikes, that makes people get out of your way. And you choose it. Oh, it's just fashionable now, isn't it? But you all choose the same fashion. Consider that for a moment. Consider why you do it. Consider why you're so keen to wear a hooded top indoors when the school is heated and you pull the hood over your face. And you begin to understand what the Nazis were able to achieve. They combined something that made people fear you a little bit as youth and, and gave you the ability to use that and told you, told you it was important. And the education aspect of schools into something else. They're going to use the youth. Now, in a lesson, this would go on for a bit longer and bounce off your facial expressions and your comments. I can't do that in a pre-recorded video and I apologize, but hopefully you've got a, a smattering of what I'm trying to put across. What I'm gonna try and do now, just kill a fly is what I'm gonna try and do and I can't pause the thing. Um, this is the awful title, I'm sorry, it's supposed to, yeah, the animation's broken. It says, how did the Nazis try to get control and gain the support of young people? Did they succeed? Don't worry, it's clearer in a moment, so don't pause here. It's ridiculous, it won't work. Try, um, try this bit. Uh, hang on, I'll get rid of my face. So, this, if you open up the PowerPoint, is the next slide after the introductory slide. And you'll notice that this is one of those sheets that I would have printed off on A3. Uh, except that I would have printed this off in A4 and the A3 sheet would have gone around the outside to give you space to answer the questions. Uh, this would have been in the top left corner in case you're wondering. You're more than welcome to use this to guide your note taking. It is designed to help everybody. Uh, originally, by the way, it was designed to help those students who really struggle with taking notes. And if that's you, this was made for you. But I also found that the top end, uh, students that were really good at taking notes, also benefited from having these questions rather than just writing down everything that appeared on the board. Uh, those in the middle, uh, the rest of you, I guess, people like myself, fine, take the notes however you wish. Use this if you want to. Uh, it wasn't designed to support you as much, but it will. Um, and you might just want to take notes as well. What am I saying? Do what you like. It's here to help you. Use it if it helps you. Don't feel you have to. Um, I've left it up long, long enough now, so I'll move on. Um, whoops. There we go. So you'll also notice I've got three levels at the top, and this is also important. It's designed to help you understand where the grades go. So grade five is if you're able to describe Nazi youth movements and activities. Now, obviously, it's a source based uh, unit. If you can link it to sources, that is even better. Grade seven is if you can explain why those policies exist and then link it to source material. That goes without saying. Grade nine is evaluating how far they are successful. What's an evaluation? It's giving both sides before you reach a conclusion and weighing them together through comparison. So I'm not just going on the one hand, on the other hand, finish. You've got to compare them. You've got to directly compare things. That is evaluation. Otherwise it's just, you know, box standard comparison. So keeping all that in mind, so let's start with this. We're gonna start with Nazi aims for German youth. Um, I'll put my face back on because it's sometimes easier to see what I'm looking like when I'm saying these things. So the Nazi aims for German youth, there are about six of them. And most of these link with ideology. You'll remember from when we did the ideology way back at the beginning, I think it was lesson zero, uh, possibly lesson one, I can't quite remember. Uh, we talked about what the Nazi aims were, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer, which were based on the bedrock of racism and racial purity. Well, here it is again, you have racial purity and physical perfection. Now the two things, aren't the same. Racial purity is this idea that uh, the Herrenvolk and the, sorry, the creators of culture and the bearers of culture would have children that reflected them. So bearers of culture would be anyone that's not Aryan and you would not mix with other racial types within that bearers of culture. So looking at myself with my brown hair, brown eyes, I would marry and have children with another brown hair, brown eyed person. Um, and same colour skin obviously, goes without saying. Whereas your Herrenvolk, your Aryans with the blonde hair, blue eyes, would marry only blonde hair, blue eyed people and have blonde hair, blue eyed children. That's what we mean by racial purity. It's not as simple as, oh, Hitler wants everyone to be blonde hair, blue eyed. He doesn't, of course he doesn't. Physical perfection 
is something else. It's about breeding, it's about having the right family, but you can't really have that as an aim for the youth. Physical perfection also comes from exercise and physical education. It comes from everybody, well, basically Joe Wicks is what I'm saying. Um, they wanted everybody to be Joe Wicksian. They wanted them to do those physical reps. When governments and commentators talk about having compulsory sport, and they talk about doing it more often. They're generally talking about this idea of physical perfection to show the benefits of civilization. They can dress it up how they want, but unfortunately, all the good ideas following physical activity have to fight this political notion that physical perfection is essentially fascist. Um, secondly, they want to control their education. Uh, by the way, that first point, I'm not suggesting that uh, being fit is somehow bad. Of course it isn't, it's not a fascist act. Um, I'm merely pointing out that some people, for a whole host of reasons, aren't able to show that physical perfection, and therefore the assumption that people who don't show physical perfection are somehow not trying hard enough or just need more input uh, is, is it in its, that, that's where the fascism lives, um, not the desire to make everybody exercise. Don't get me wrong. Uh, two, they wanted to control their education. So the other thing the Nazis want is to indoctrinate. They want everyone to learn what it is to be a German. Bear in mind, Germany didn't exist before 1871. By the time the Nazis come to power, Germany's existed for just 60 odd years. There are people alive who do not, who cannot be Germans because Germany didn't exist. Um, so they've got to create it. And education is a wonderful way of creating identity. You'll notice this in history. We, we do our island story. That's actually how Michael Gove, a former education secretary, said we should teach history, our island story, i.e. to create a British identity, which in Michael Gove's estimation was male, middle class, white. Just saying. Um, there's something in there. So to control education would be to create a narrative and create a way of getting you, the youth, to focus on what the state wanted you to focus on. So the Nazis are very keen on that. They also want to control the youth's leisure time. They want to make sure that there's no way out of being Nazis, that they want to make everything, the Grundjahre, the Frühjahre, um, early years, um, about being a Nazi. There's a special name for it. It's gone from my head. Now, I can't remember it. Don't worry, you'll never need to put in an exam. It's one of those German terms that I like using. And I've obviously forgotten it because I'm at home. Of course, I was going to do that. Uh, but they want to control leisure time so there's no way out and everything you had to do was Nazi controlled. And the reason for this is to gain and keep the support of the youth, to make sure that there was no way out and no way of possibly not being a Nazi. And that brings me to the next point. The whole point behind all of this is to indoctrinate the youth into being Nazis, to Nazify the youth, so that they cannot escape joining the Nazis, becoming part of the Nazis. Why? Well, you kind of heard that in the speech. Uh, if you haven't watched it already, go and watch it now. In that speech to the youth, in the Triumph of the Will, you will see that there was this talk of making them style hard, steal hard, and learn privation, and to rip banners and hold them aloft. It's very militaristic language, and it's all about training soldiers to fight wars. And you need, if you're gonna have soldiers to fight wars, more children. That's you, ladies. The Nazis try to achieve these aims, all of them, through the Hitler Youth. They don't use much else, and in some cases, even try to ignore schools. So keep that in mind. It's why it's there in bold with stars. Do the same in your notes, I guess. That's how the Nazis are doing it. Uh, everything they do, I don't know everything they do, they do it for you. Um, but that, sorry, I just had to pause and I realized I came off mid sentence. I apologize. So Nazi and education. Um, the important area of Nazi control is education. It links to the Hitler Youth. The, oh, you'll notice I call the Hitler Youth the HJ because it's the Hitler Jugend of Deutsch. Um, and I've said before in the course, it's, the Nazis are a German phenomenon in many ways, and it pays to use their terminology because, well, it's easier to write. So I don't call them the HY, I call them the HJ, the Hitler Jugend, because it's German. You don't have to use those terms. Teachers had to join the National Socialist Lehrerbund, the NSLB. Uh, they had to be part of the Nazi Teachers Union, essentially. Uh, this was, ah, that's the word, Gleichschaltung. 
this idea of setting everything up so that it was impossible not to be Nazi. It, like Schalten, was the creation of a Nazi German state. It's one Jan Herzfeld, the creator of that poster, uh, Heil Hitler with the dead man, uh, the 30th of June, 1934. It's what he was protesting against when he changed his name to John Hartfield. If to be German was to be Nazi, like Schalten, then he was no longer German and he'll take an English name and live in Czechoslovakia. Many head teachers who ran schools, so people like Mr. McNamara, objected to this. They said that the state interference in education and teaching in a very particular way and with a very particular aim in mind was wrong and that the youth should be taught to think for themselves and that the youth should have a choice in the matter about what they wanted to be and that schools were the wrong place for any kind of political indoctrination. And, and fair play to them. A lot of them resigned in protest. But the thing is, and you'll find this, you'll know this, you, you've been taught by teachers, you know how this works. There'll always be someone who'll take their place. Someone who'll go, nah, I don't care. And we'll take that role. And they did. So again, opposition did nothing. Um, the curriculum, what students learned, was changed to reflect the Nazi values. Um, so PE became a huge thing, like massive. Not like it is in modern schools, where PE is an important part of it, but it's not massive and huge. We're talking about it being virtually everything. Uh, so what you gain in PE decides where you sit elsewhere in other classes. Uh, they had race studies uh, rather than biology. I talk about the changing focus of biology. Biology became all about genetics, which in that point was a science in its in infancy. People didn't understand, well, they didn't have DNA for a start, but they understood that genes were a thing and they understood that breeding was a thing and that there was some kind of thing happening when you bred two people together. So they didn't know, for example, that blue eyes and blonde hair were a recessive set of genes or alleles, I think. Um, is it alleles that are recessive? I'm not a science teacher. And they talked about race studies and how you could define the race by measuring things like the nose and putting pencils in hair. No, I'm not joking. It was that simplistic and stupid. Um, boxing. Now, you might think they'd learn about our oh, Marquis of Crimsbury rules. No, it was all about getting young children in uh, and then get, they get beaten up by older children. That's it. That's the boxing. And when you can beat up the older child, then you become the older child and you beat up the new kids. That's how it worked. And basically what you learn from that is you learn that might makes right. And you learn that when you can beat up the weak, you beat up the weak. And that's really easy to do. You don't have to educate a terribly large amount to do that. Life already teaches you that. That's why bullies exist. That's why bullying carries on. Our school has no bullying problem. Um, needlework for the girls, because why not? Um, it's where textiles was born. And yeah, while the boys are busy beating seven bells out of one another, it's all right, ladies, you can repair their socks. Yeah, I know, it's, it's that misogynistic, that insulting, that simplistic. Um, but it worked, it kind of worked, because let's face it, ladies, if you had the opportunity to have a class without boys, yes, Jerry, a class without boys, there are no boys. Um, I guess there isn't if you're at home. Yeah, anyway, if you had the opportunity to have classes without boys, ladies, you'd seize it. Of course you would. It's just easier, isn't it? I mean, seriously, sorry, gentlemen, but we know this to be true. If you had an opportunity to have a class without girls, let's face it, we'd take it. Um, and the changing focus of biology, I kind of already touched on, but there was a changing focus on history too. It was teaching a narrative of Germany as a heroic nation, as a nation to be feared, as a nation to be respected, as a nation with a proud and glorious past. And I've mentioned this already. Prussia hadn't lost a war since 1802. Think about that for a moment. If you're taught in a militaristic fashion, and you're taught that Prussia hadn't lost a war, and that Germany only lost one war, and that was down to politicians, well, boys, you and I both know the appeal to military technology, the appeal to military stuff. We like it. We do. When our girlfriends inevitably ask us, what are you thinking about? We can never tell them the truth can't because you all know what the answer is well actually i put a sniper post in that building up there and i was just thinking that that bit of that bush would be a great place to hide secret messages and um if i was flying a jet plane um i'd love to fly it down this street because it's just about wide enough because it's crazy 
Our thoughts are crazy. My point is, making history more militarized, talking about battles, it appeals. And there was a structure to Nazi youth movements. Now, if we're in a lesson, I would use this section down here, oops, this section down here to draw it, uh, a little sort of umbrella organization. As it is, you don't have to trust me. Um, so you've got the Hitler Jugend, the HJ, is an umbrella term. It's everything. And there are lots of different sub bits beneath it. You'll never need to know them in detail, but it's always handy to have them in the back of your mind. So if you need them for an example or to make a point, you can just throw them at the page. Uh, there are actually four organizations underneath that. There are girls organizations, two, and boys organizations, also two. Um, the leader of all of them, you heard him speak on the video, and if you haven't, go watch it, is Balder von Schirach. Uh, as I say on the video, he's kind of like a Nazi Baden Powell and he answers directly to Hitler. So it goes, youth organizations, Balder von Schirach, Hitler. That's how important Hitler and the Nazis see the youth. In the boys, between the ages of 10 and 14, you're in the Deutsche Jungen, German boys or German youth. And then from the ages of 14 to 18, you're in the Hitler Jugend, the Hitler youth. Uh, and you had uniforms that denote these. Now there is a third organization, the Younger Fellows, um, the Younger, uh, is it Younger Younger? Young Fellows? I forget what Fellows translates as, uh, but it wasn't a proper uniformed organization. You've seen them in the opposition pictures that I showed you in that source, where I said how useful these sources, and you showed the seven-year-old with blonde hair doing the, the, the thing. I'm not doing it properly. Please don't think I just did that. Um, I mean, I did put my arm up, but it wasn't a proper salute. I was pointing out what they look like in the photograph. Um, so yeah, you've got the seven-year-olds in that. For the girls, between the ages of 10 and 14, you're in the younger Mädchen, the young girls. And then from 14 to 18, you're the Bundesdeutsches Mädchen, uh, the uh, Union of German Girls, because apparently girls don't grow up. Um, and again, you had uniforms. Now you saw them in the video as well. They were the ones in the background wearing the blouses with the sort of cross tie thing. The intention was that as you progress through these groups, like Cubs and Scouts, I suppose, on leaving at the age of 18, you'd be used to a regimented way of doing things. You would owe it to your youth leaders and want to feel like you wanted to give something back. Um, and a lot of youth do. Uh, so if you're in a uniformed organization, I've been in Cubs and Scouts, there is an expectation you go on to Venture Scouts and there is an expectation you move on and move into another service part of the economy. Um, it's a very important part of it. And they, they really stress the uh, royal family very if you've noticed it. And the intention was that when you left these groups, you would join another Nazi group, another sort of the plethora of uniformed organizations. So you join the DAF, uh, the German Workers' Front, uh, Deutsche Arbeiten Front, uh, the German Trade Union, we've mentioned this before, the Nazi Trade Union, the NSF, the National Association for Frauen, uh, the women's organization, uh, which in many ways was the only way women could progress. So it was the only thing they could do. It was actually quite popular. Or the uh, DS, I forget what that stands for. I think it's the Deutsche, Deutsche Sicherheitsdienst, um, the Deutsche Service, I, I forget. Uh, basically, it's kind of like, um, kind of like a, a, a workers' army sort of thing. Or you join the SA, uh, those brown-shirted people that used to be led by Röhm before it was machine gun to death. Um, it's more like Schaltung. Basically, the Nazis control all of the outlets for all of the things. It wasn't compulsory to join the Hitler Youth until 1939, which is a change brought about by the Second World War. And in many ways, from 1939 onwards, membership actually goes down. Before 1939, from 1933, it was kind of peer pressure to join. Um, and of course, state pressure to join. Uh, the, the big campaign, do I have a photograph? No, I don't. Um, is the all 10 year old source. This, by the way, is a picture of the uh, Hitler Jugend. And again, if I was in lesson, I would point out that the haircuts are not exactly out of fashion. And I can guarantee you I'd be able to find some people in that photograph that look like some people in the room. Um, this video lesson is being done for the whole of year 10, so I can't make specific references, it wouldn't be fair. But look closely, gentlemen, I suspect you will find yourself in there somewhere. Um, so, yeah, sorry, that's the, uh, the Hitler Jugend. Do I have anything else? Yeah, there they are. There's the, uh, the idea of taking over schools. Um, the idea that the uniforms there scare the teacher. That's why they're doing it. Imagine if you could wear your fearful uniform 
and do it to teachers. In fact, some of you try that. Um, here it is, this is what I wanted to talk about. Um, this one on this side says, uh, youth serve the Führer. You can dient dem Führer. And underneath it's got this uh, sort of logo, this, this slogan, Alla senjaren, uh, senjarigen, sorry, in the hagjot, ha hagjot, um, all 10 year olds in the Hitler Youth. This one says, Wir, it means we. Uh, Deutsches Jungen, Jungvolk, something Hitler Jugend, oh, in, in der, in der Hitler Jugend. Um, and again, it's German young people join the Hitler Youth. This is the pressure we're talking about, a campaign to get all 10 year olds into the Hitler Youth. So, although it's not compulsory, there is pressure. Also, to get a job in the civil service, which is a highly paid state service job, you had to be in the Hitler Youth. Uh, to get an apprenticeship position, you had to be in the Hitler Youth. To join in any kind of sporting facilities, like literally anything, to turn up and play football, to turn up and play tennis, you had to be in the Hitler Youth. The Hitler Youth controlled the sports stadiums. If you weren't in the Hitler Youth, you couldn't go swimming, for example. You wouldn't be allowed in. Uh, oh, sorry, it's being used by the Hitler Youth at the moment. Sorry, mate, you'll have to come back later. So there is all kinds of pressure, subtle and not so subtle, to get people to join the Hitler Youth. I'll take my face away because it's in the way now, isn't it? Um, what did the Hitler Youth do? Well, the idea was that the Hitler Youth was home and it was school, and the Hitler Youth organized specific activities. Now, what they actually did varied by who's in charge of the group, and the group leaders were given enormous latitude, and the group leaders were very, very good. They were generally younger, they were generally in touch with what the youth wanted, and they had the welfare of their youth and the people in their group as their highest regard. Indeed, that's why they were chosen. And if that meant they had to go against the system, then they were encouraged to do so, even if that was the Nazi system. The idea was that the charges, the, the youth yourselves, would trust their group leader implicitly. And that's important. So the group leader would listen to you. The group leader would truly listen to you. Imagine if teachers did that. Imagine if anybody did that to you and listened, properly listened to what you had to say. Now imagine they didn't just do that, but they acted on it. You are going to trust them. And if they introduced ideas that when you got angry at, say, your parents or people you didn't like, and they said, well, how about we teach them a lesson? Don't worry, we're not gonna hurt them. But how about we teach them a lesson to listen to you? In your anger, after an argument with your parents, say, you might agree and you might tell them information that they can then use to teach your parents a lesson. And then you might come to believe in revenge and a little bit of hate as being important because it gets you what you want. Huh like Shelton. Now the group leaders had a choice of things they could do. They could do physical fitness like gymnastics or boxing. Again, boxing like I talked about before, it's just beating up younger children. Um, and they also had gymnastics for the girls. And I love this photograph. Uh, girls, look carefully at this photograph. It's every photograph that's ever been taken of you and your friends. You'll recognize yourselves somewhere in this. The girl that doesn't really want to be there in any way, shape or form the girl that's actually quite good at what she does, but only really wants to be there with her friend, the girl that wants to be in the photograph, but doesn't want to be in the photograph and will hide from the camera, the girl that succeeded by hiding from the camera, uh, the girl that wants to show off but realizes she can't, um, the girl that sort of turned up with the wrong kit that day, uh, the girl that uh, is like, yes, and I am different to the rest of you, uh, the girl that doesn't really want to be different to the rest of you, the girl that is looking at the other girl and is slightly jealous, uh, it's all going on, the friendships. The, it, I just love the photograph. It's, it's every school photograph I've ever seen of a sports team. Why am I getting so uh, waxing lyrical about it? Because it proves something about the Hitler Youth. They're not just ideologues, they're not nutters, they are ordinary people. They are you. They are me as a young person. Um, maybe not this one. Um, I mean, as far as you know. They also go on camps. 
uh, there are campfires, which is a traditional German activity. If you've been on a scout camp, you know what I'm talking about here. They sing campfire songs. Um, they play games like spiders were. Uh, this is a traditionally popular activity in Germany. It's not really a British thing anymore, but it was in Germany when the Nazis were around. So what the Germans are doing is hijacked by the Nazis and told, this is a Nazi thing. And if you're young, you don't really know any different. Uh, not in the sense that you're not intelligent, but you're too young to realize that it predates the Nazis, is my point. Uh, as far as you know, it is the Nazis. Um, there's pageantry. Uh, they get the youth involved in parades and festivals. Sorry, that's the camps. Uh, you get a feel for the size of these things and the community that must have been created in that. Everything in there is a tent. I don't know about you, I'd love to spend the night under campus. Um, here's the pageantry. Uh, look at that fellow there. He's so pleased, isn't he? Look at him. So proud of himself. Um, and I've seen that myself. I, I've seen students get involved in school productions. I've seen students get involved in things at school and the kind of students that their peers and even themselves wouldn't expect to get involved in those things. Maybe they were forced into it and they, they, they grow. You can see them grow into the role and it's a powerful, powerful thing. You must know yourselves how easy it is. Well, I say how easy it is. How easy it is to feel motivated, not how easy it is to be motivated. If people appear to listen to you and give you some responsibility and then, and here's the kicker, trust you with it. You know how easy it is to, well, feel a bit complimented. Um, also, all education reinforced Nazi beliefs. Do I have anything on that one? No, I don't. There was also a Fuhrer cult. Uh, and you swear oaths of loyalty to Hitler. And to show the point here, we've got a photo, poster, uh, the youth served their Fuhrer, uh, all 10 year olds in the HJ, and of course you've got Hitler in the background with the young child looking into it. And it's interesting, this is a film still from the uh, Triumph of the Will, uh, as is that actually. So it's a very deliberate process that you are going to grow up to be like Hitler. What do boys do? They do a lot of military drill um, and they do a lot of training for military stuff. So there's a lot of uh, scavenging and uh, wide games and uh, ambushes and what have you, making catapults, that sort of thing. Girls, I'm sorry girls, you get to do needlework, you get to do folk dancing, uh, you know, like dancing around a maypole, and you get to help out with the Nazi charity, the Winter Hildstair. Don't worry, you'll never need to spell it, just call it the WHW, it's fine. It's a Nazi charity, uh, that's all you need to know. And you would volunteer for that. So that's the activities. How popular was it? Well, actually, pretty popular. Um, when you think about it, you can't do sporting activities unless you're a member of the Hitler Youth. Uh, you can't get the good jobs unless you're a member of the Hitler Youth. And the actual activities the Hitler Youth do are popular and well-liked, and they're run by people who know what they're doing, who care. Um, that's going to get people joining it, obviously. So, yeah, the vast majority of youth joined. It's, it's upwards of 80%. I don't know about you, but 80% of you doing anything is an amazing thought. Even in school, if we try to get you to line up on a, uh, the mugger in a fire drill, getting you to line up in straight lines and quietly is virtually impossible. 80% of you? I wish we could get 80% of you to stand quietly. To get 80% of you to join up to the Hitler Youth, it's got to be good. You don't do that unless you want to, is my point. You can't force that many people to join. Um, why was it so powerful? Well, it was a strong sense of belonging. You got to know your group, uh, your grouper. Uh, you got to know who was in your group. You got to know your group leader. Your group leader got to know you. You became, well, reflections of one another. And many of the activities they do are popular. They're liked. People want to do these things. They are fun. And if you came from the countryside where there was literally nothing, you got an opportunity to visit the world to go around Germany to see different job opportunities and not just go into the drudgery of agricultural labor. Now, I realize some of you are in a rural area, but I imagine you've got aspirations if you're going to university to go to a city-based university rather than a rural one. This is what this offered. But it wasn't all a garden of roses. From 1939 onwards, the Second World War, our first hint that things changed with the Second World War. I will do this separately, by the way. We'll do a lesson on the Second World War later in the course. It's less popular. And the reason for that is it's made compulsory. I mean, there are other reasons too, but this is the background one. No matter how much you enjoy something, 
no matter how much you want to do something, if you are told you have to do it, well, then of course you don't. You know this, I know this. It's how we operate as human beings. Oh, I'm being told to do this thing that I actually enjoy. Well, I'm not gonna enjoy it then. You know this. If we said that it was a safety aspect about lining up quietly, you probably do it. But because we force you to line up quietly on a fire drill, you don't. It's as simple as that. Um, if we were to convince you that lining up outside a lessons was an important act, you would do it. In fact, usually a bark at year sevens will get them to do it because they recognize it's important. And the importance, by the way, is you come in in an orderly fashion, it's easier to find your seat and it's easier to switch from social aspect to learning much more quickly. And it allows you to get down to business more quickly uh, and get through the register more quickly. The reason you don't do that intrinsically is because you see it as an imposition on your uh, right to be you and you'll kick against it and because very few people enforce it. You don't see the value of it. Uh, and those that do enforce it, you just view as sticklers. Uh, Educational psychology is fun. Um, and as an historian, I can't help it. So yeah, it's made compulsory and because it's compulsory, people don't like it. But also there is the growth of opposition movements to the Hitler Jugend. Things like the Edelweiss Pirates, the Swing Youth, uh, the Swing gegen die Nazis, uh, the, um, I can't stop saying, um, Edelweiss Pirates, Swing Youth, White Rose Movement. These groups grow and youth like the idea of opposition. And especially when you're actually morally in the right, that's always handy. Uh, and with the coming of the Second World War, there was more military drill. No one really likes military drill. I mean, boys who like the military think they'll like the military drill, and then they learn what it actually is. And it's boring and it's mind numbing. That's its whole point. And so they rapidly lose interest. And as the Second World War progresses, it turns out that people who are good with youth groups and that are really in touch with what their youth groups want make absolutely fantastic officers. They can think on their feet, they can care for their troops, they can take decisions on the ground without having to be told orders, and they can make rapid advances very easily. They are good soldiers, so they get recruited as officers. And who gets to replace them? Well, you can't replace them with people who will make good officers. You need them in the army. Instead, you get the sticklers for the rules, you get the mini dictators, you get, well, people who aren't very good. And so the youth, they don't like it anymore. They're being babysat rather than listened to. So there are a whole host of factors why it gets less in, uh, popular. How much less popular? Well, it never dips below around about 70%. So yeah, there's a change. But it's not huge, don't overemphasize this, but it, it does mean the people who are there probably enjoy it less, are probably less supportive. It probably wasn't as effective in making little Nazis as it had been before 1939. And it's just less popular overall, I guess. Conclusions then, where do we come with all this? Young people are clearly a priority for the Nazis. It is important to the Nazis that they get young people on side. There are several, six, I believe, key aims behind setting up the Hitler Jugend, which I've done at the beginning in the box marked one, Nazi aims for the German youth. The Hitler Jugend was intended to shape the Nazis of the future. And there are two strands to this. There's folkishness, that is trying to create a rural romanticism of living in the countryside, of foraging of working as a people's community, folkish. And also Gleichschaltung, making all things Nazi, so that anything that was German was by definition Nazi. And it's impressive how much people today still believe this, which shows how effective it was as a propaganda tool. The aims of the Hitler Jugend link very clearly, I think, to the wider ideals of Nazi ideology. The racism is there in the physical perfection. The hatred is there in how the Hitler Jugend appeals to its members. The militarism is there in the Ein Reich, the, the, the idea of overturning the Treaty of Versailles, etc. The misogyny and making girls and boys very separate things is there in the idea of Einführer, responsive to someone's will, do as you're told, and 
Ein Volk is there in this idea of a people's community and the way the school and leisure time were joined under that one head. So the aims and the structure of how the Nazis deal with the youth is right there in our ideology. So you can make that draw through. And hopefully you can see why it was important that we started with what the Nazis were in terms of ideology. There is a worksheet and the second part of the lesson, lesson 14, I guess, because it'll take about an hour, is to go through these sources and have a go at these tasks. And if you wish to submit them, you can, but well, actually do submit, do submit them. I say wish to submit them. Oh, there it is. Um, there are only four tasks here. They're not terribly difficult, but they get you used to looking through source material and using details from the source material to back up what you're saying. The other skill that we're practicing is inference. And you'll remember from the last piece of assessed work that you did, that inference is important. So think about who created the sources. Think about why they were created. Think about the context in which they were created and then look at the content to back up what you've learned from who created it. And that includes the photographs and it includes the posters and it includes uh, these weird statements with the, uh, what is it, the itinerary. That's a sort of travel map for a Hitler Youth Group. You get the idea. There's an extract from a letter as well. There's Handstem. That's why I didn't go through it too much at the beginning. So these questions aren't difficult, but they are practicing skills that will be important to you. A reminder about these posts, I'll remove my face. Uh, so if you want to pause the video here, uh, you can see those posters in more detail and more depth. And if you want to use these like you used the uh, two posts with the Volksgenossen and the Ventilsberg, um, Ein Fog, Hilft, Ein Selbt, I can't remember exactly how it goes, um, you can, because you can see that same thing. You've got the Z structure, you've got the statement at the top, and you've got the little statement at the bottom, and you've got the drawing of the I down the Z. In this one, it's with the girl's awestruck gaze. In this one, it's with the boy's eyes and Hitler's eyes, both looking in the same direction, it draws the eye down. And it's simple, and it's effective, and it flies under the radar. You're almost don't realize what's going on here and how Nazified it is. There's racial policies in there, for example, and the importance of the youth. So if something like this turns up in an exam, you are quids in. So if you want to print these out and annotate them or just pause them on the screen and have a think about them. I hopefully have talked about them enough. Uh, there we go. Last thing to finish with is this uh, Hitler Youth Parade in the formation of a swastika uh, on the 27th of August in 1933. Why am I showing you this? This is how powerful the Hitler Youth was, uh, the Hitler Jugend was, in 1933. Hitler isn't full dictator yet. He won't be full dictator until 1934. When I say that the Hitler Jugend was popular, this is what I mean. This was voluntary. This is before anybody can be forced. To simply say, oh, people joined because they were forced, is to misunderstand the power and the allure and the attraction of the Hitler Jugend. Um, yeah, just to make that point. To finish, uh, this last slide, and I'm very deliberately showing it to you, you will notice is everything I talked through on the main slide, but without the images. So you'll be able to print this off as it stands if you want to annotate around it. Um, I perhaps should have said that at the beginning. Uh, if you've already done it, don't worry, you can cut these boxes up and stick them in the relevant places near your notes uh, to make sense of them, I guess. Um, and yeah, that is the youth. The, whoops, sorry about that. That is the youth. The second lesson of this sequence, so lesson 14, will be the worksheet. And yeah, that'll be it for now. I will see you later in the week. Uh, or rather, you'll see me later in the week, and I'll do women because that's my other favourite thing. And then we will have our next practice, I guess. Uh, so lesson 15 will be on women, and then we'll move on. This will be the chapter on how we change lives. We'll finish on the economics, which will drive us towards war. We're in position that we're going to finish this, well, this term, actually. Um, letters have gone out. You now hopefully know that there will be provision 
for you to come in and do some history lessons. Those history lessons will be mainly catch up. The stuff I'm doing now, this last lesson, will not be in that catch up because originally we were designing it for a 1st of June return. So it's only recently changed to 15th of June and 18th of June, I think is when I see you first. I don't know. The point is, don't worry too much. The minimum has already passed. So if you have been, thank you very much for watching. Have a lovely rest of day, Year 10. I hope this video was useful. I hope I haven't rambled too much. And I hope that the notes you've made work for you. Any questions, any problems, ask in the comments on the Show My Homework section. And the member of staff, be it myself or anyone else, will be happy to help as soon as we can. Thank you very much, Year 10. Um, stay safe out there and we'll be in touch.